Hello there! Back in June, I travelled across America with my brother Gordon. There he is. We hopped between eight different cities on our journey from the west coast to the east coast. Three of the cities we visited were ones I had already kind of been to in video game form. LA I knew almost like the back of my hand thanks to my 25 days spent in GTA Online, New Orleans I had briefly experienced when I tried my hand at Mafia 3, and New York I had of course experienced in many a video game over the years, most recently during 2018 in Marvel Spider-Man. When I wasn't annoying my brother or googling the best free things to do in each place, the trip got me thinking a lot about video game worlds, and the quite breathtaking way designers and developers craft their locations, and how important video video game worlds are when creating a masterpiece game. But when I thought about it, I realised that the truly magnificent game worlds that I've played in are few and far between. So many fall short and as a result never remain as memorable. So what makes a video game world great? How can so many creators miss the mark with theirs? And for the love of god, why could no Starbucks employee in America spell my name right? Well, I might be a drama queen, but I'm not a developer. But people seem to be liking me taking on videos that discuss game design, so I might not be able to make you the perfect video game world. But what I can do is talk to you about my favourite video game worlds and try to find some things that they all do right. Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. The first thing I realised when I started making notes about the best video game places is that they're all down to earth but with a twist. I think it's important that they're grounded in some kind of reality, but that they also have something to them that makes them totally unique. Rapture, the setting of Bioshock, is a 20s city, which is a cool enough setting for a piece of fiction as it is, but the twist is that it's an underwater 20s city. Something about a city built underwater makes it feel so otherworldly, and that's why Rapture instantly feels like a place you have to explore when you see it. San Andreas in GTA 5 is a scarily accurate recreation of LA, but the twist is that because it's a Grand Theft Auto game, it's a total caricature of itself. Dunwall in Dishonored is a Victorian city but steampunk and fueled completely by whale oil. These places all have a grounding in something relatable or even real, but with an air of magic to them. And speaking of magic... Welcome to the Magic Kingdom! If you're lucky enough to have ever been to Disney World or Disneyland or Universal Studios or Six Flags or pretty much any theme park ever, you'll know the feeling of total excitement when you enter a new world. When you enter a theme park, you can see all these amazing experiences in front of you, much like in a video game, when the player sees a landmark and they're like, whoa! I want to go there, that's a big thing, I want to climb it. Video games and theme parks have so much in common. Think about it, they're both trying to move people through their worlds in the most enjoyable and efficient ways possible. Hell, even Disneyland was originally designed around a train track because Disney was such a huge fan of model railroads. Even today, Disney parks are still made up of smaller kingdoms, much like separate levels in a video game city. Space, a final frontier. But what's even more important is making sure people have a reason to go to see each part of the theme park, right? Because if you put like six roller coasters in one part of the park and one roller coaster in a different one, it's pretty easy to see which is going to be the most popular bit. If you don't put a landmark attraction, mission, or don't send your player to one part of the world at some point in the video game, what's even the point of including it? A good example of this is in Dying Light. By this point in the game, you've probably seen this big bridge before, but because you desperately need more medical supplies at this point in the story, the game sends you there. It's a really great use of space because it also makes sense for there to be medical stuff out there in the story, because that's where a quarantine zone would be for people trying to get in and out of an infected city. It's time for a story, it's time for a story, a very special story, especially for you. Moreover, just make the world an actual storytelling tool. Think about a game like Bioshock Infinite. Everything in the city of Columbia is trying to give you information about the game's story from pretty much the opening moment. This keeps things fresh because almost nobody does this anymore. Also, quick side note, for those of you asking for more Bioshock content, I do hear you. I'm going to do a video on Infinite and how it does storytelling through its world very soon, so subscribe to catch that one. But before I give away the farm on that video, let's move on. Ha <laughs> ha! Hey, it's your boy, uh, Skinny Penis. That's right, we're talking size. And I'm about to argue why smaller is better. Okay, just look, do me a favor, don't read too much into this. I promise it's not because I have Skinny Penis. 
Alright, so it feeds into the idea of a theme park again. For those of you from the UK, or for anyone who's been to Alton Towers and Pleasure Beach in Blackpool, I hope you'll agree with me here, but I 100% prefer Pleasure Beach. Not only for the rides, but because it's a smaller, more intense park, with the next big ride literally just around the corner. At Alton Towers, on the other hand, you have to walk like half an hour to get to the next ride, which may or may not amputate your leg when you get there. Translate that to video game worlds. God, it annoys Ollie and I so much when developers are like, And it is our biggest one yet. It is four times the size of Fallout 4. I fell into a burning ring of fire. Ghost Recon Wildlands had probably the most gargantuan size of map I've ever seen in a video game, but it was all lifeless, pointless, soulless crap, so why would I ever want to explore it? In fact, I think the bigger the world is, the more daunting and off-putting it can actually be for a player. Think about stuff like New York in Marvel Spider-Man, Florence and Venice in Assassin's Creed 2, Los Santos in GTA 5, they're not trying to be the biggest worlds ever created. They're so great because they're smaller, sweeter, more intense experiences first, because once you try to achieve something bigger, you lose quality. So uh, take it from me, <laughs> bigger ain't always better. Not that I have a, not that I would know, no please. Skinny penis. All right, let's get down to business, ladies and gentlemen. You wanna go somewhere and you wanna be somebody, you better wake up and pay attention, honey. Okay, so this is one that I think separates the men from the boys a little bit. It's kind of all about how a game uses its world building tools, like posters, graffiti, notes, all that kind of stuff. In my opinion though, the key to this is a bit more about continuity. In The Witcher 3, you can be in most parts of Velen or Novigrad and hear all about the war that's currently engulfing the world. But what really makes the game impressive is when you ride through the countryside and see the remains of pitched medieval battles. But then you ride past the battlefield and you run into gangs of looters and deserters who try to rob you, or even better, a village that's been sacked and burned. The Witcher doesn't just show you that there's a war going on in the world, it shows you the effects that war has on the world and its people. I loved Hall Pass. <laughs> What a great move. Jason Sudeikis, what a fun character. Ah, my favorite awful video game trope. Our world is a character. I fell in. Video games should not try to make their world a character. Because I'm pretty sure if most developers tried to model their worlds like they do their characters, they'll end up with some pretty one dimensional worlds, am I right? Instead, developers should focus on making a real, authentic, living world. But. What does that mean, and how do you do it? Well, first off, if you're gonna put people in your game, take Agent Smith's advice from the Matrix Revolutions. Don't make your world's inhabitants temporary constructs of a feeble human intellect trying desperately to justify an existence that is without meaning or purpose. <laughs> One oddly specific reference my brain pulled up for that one. The best worlds are ones that give their NPCs reasons for actually being there in the first place. The Witcher 3, again, is a phenomenal example of this. Every contract and side quest you go on is so fully written and thought out, making even the most seemingly irrelevant character mean something to the game. One of the most important things in soap opera acting is reacting. This does not mean acting again. <laughs> Finally, if the world is fully alive, it should react to what the player does. Nothing is more of a letdown than taking part in an earth-shattering mission of the grandest scale, only for it to have no bearing or consequence in the game afterwards. It's why Breath of the Wild felt a bit flat for Ollie. Every time you kill an enemy or some goblins or what have you, they just respawn because of the Blood Moon. The player's actions have pretty much no bearing on the world, so it almost feels like there's a disconnect and what you do doesn't actually matter. Instead, think about Spider-Man or GTA 4. Every time you do a mission in one of those games, you hear a radio report or a podcast from Pulitzer Prize winning journalist to J. Jonah- TWO TIME! Ugh. A podcast from two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, J. Jonah Jameson, that reacts to what you've just done. It's a small thing, but it makes such a difference because it makes the player feel like they've had an effect on a real, living, reacting place. Then, on the flip side, the player will be able to save the game, turn it off, and go to bed, with the full and utter confidence that that living, breathing world is still going on without them, ready, waiting for them to jump back in tomorrow. Thank you so much for watching! I hope you enjoyed the video. What did I miss?
What do you think is important for video game worlds? And what is your favourite video game world? Tell me all about it down in the comments below. If you want more of our content to consume, feel free to check out our podcast pod coping on Spotify, SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, and all other major podcast providers. Did you know that we end each episode of our podcast with a shout out of a random subscriber from here on YouTube? Head on over and see if this episode's subscriber is you. Also check out our Medium publication where we put out a weekly gaming news summary about the biggest stories of the week. You can find links to all these things down in the description, but please don't forget to subscribe, hit that bell icon, check out more videos, and above all, tune in next time.